Okay, so I've got my very basic setup for the site analysis drawing. And now I want to add a few other things before I bring this into Photoshop and either combine it with something you've done. Have you brought anything from this project into Photoshop as a JPEG or something like that already? No, okay, so maybe we'll do the setup from Photoshop uh, or in Photoshop from scratch then. And so here you can see obviously we've got the um, the roads uh, surrounding the site there, shown in green. And I want to get a sun path diagram that goes around the site. So you'll find if you go into the uh, site plans in Revit, any of them, you can turn on the sun path simply by going down and clicking on the sun icon, and you've got the options there for sun path on and off. And of course, you can go to sun settings to see what your setup is. And so there, I'm going to set it to still, where you get the options then for setting a date, time and location. I don't know why, but for some reason a lot of the computers in here are coming up with Canberra as a location. I think because part of the network maybe is there, I don't know, but uh, Canberra is different to Sydney. It's not that different, but it's, it's different enough for you to think about changing it. I'm going to browse there. And normally it will detect your location. This is this works pretty well, this um, mapping service. But here, because of the way the internet connection works, sometimes it either doesn't work or it's just too slow. So instead I'm going to change to the default city list where you can just choose most cities in the world from the list there. Definitely all the big big cities. Okay, so it's interesting there. Sydney, so the latitude of Canberra you can see is 35.3. Um, do you know the latitude of Sydney? It's 35 points, sorry, 33.6 from memory, something like that. But around 34, like we'll just round it off to 34 degrees. But it's slightly, slightly off that. The longitude is 160 something, I think, from memory. And if you were still doing your shadow diagrams by hand, the way I had to many years ago, uh, you would know those figures. You do use them when you're calculating these things. So why can't I see Sydney? Because I'm, there we go, I'm following the alphabet. So there's Sydney, Australia, not Canada, of course. And so what you might see then is that you have these presets for solstice, summer solstice, winter solstice and the two equinoxes which are the same so you don't usually need two of those. I don't know why they actually bother. I suppose it's just so that people don't get confused but spring and autumn equinox are identical so you normally just do one drawing for those and then um, again one each for the summer and the winter solstice. So they're the basic presets you should have but you're then also going to need additional um, presets for different times. So don't fall into the trap of adjusting this time when you've already set up a view that's using that preset. Okay, so maybe just to make it clear, do you know the times you will need to do, say, shadow diagrams? Yeah, exactly, that's standard. So 9, 12 and 3 are the normal times. So I'm just going to make those, I know I'll need them. And they'll also help me with the, um, the work I'm doing now. So I'm going to click on the duplicate button. There's, notice there's no new button. You can't just make a new preset. All you can do is duplicate an existing one. So I'll do that. So I'm going to call this Summer Solstice 0900. And then I'll change the time to 9. Then I'm going to go to this again and make it Summer Solstice uh, let's just do the extreme, 1500. Come back and do the midday one later. Well, actually, we've got the original one, which is set to midday anyway. Okay, so so that's done. I've got those sun settings. So remember, it's using summer solstice uh, three o'clock. And so, if I turn shadows on, 
they'll be cast from that direction or according to that date and time but what do I still need to do to get the shadows right? exactly this is uh, in the true north view so north is straight up by default and so you've probably been shown that you can change your sun direction in the true north view but you've got the line work from the AutoCAD file in a different view so you've got a couple of options there you can either draw something like a reference plane to locate that north arrow and use that to set the sun direction to set north so in your true north view that's an option but a good thing to know this forever is that you can change any view to true north a lot of people don't know this but in your properties I'll, I'll right click and duplicate just so that you can see the difference between this and the original so I'll duplicate with detailing of course because I won't get the AutoCAD file unless I choose that and then I'm going to rename that new view site instead of site survey oops I'll call it true north survey and so then I'm going to go down into the in view properties and change the orientation there from project north to true north I won't change anything in the view but it'll mean I can go to the manage tab and then go to position and location and it comes up okay so under project location you've got this button here which I think is called position and location or position there you are and then rotate through north and it'll let me do it if this wasn't set to true north that option wouldn't be available so you can only set true north in a true north view so then you get the gizmo that pops up that you probably have seen before when you use rotate as well so you've got the angles down there and at the bottom of that line there's a base point so I need to drag that base point onto the end of my the tail end of my north arrow let go and then I can snap the line that measures my angle onto any point on the line of that north arrow so that's setting my base angle now I can come around and make that vertical so really what you're trying to do in a true north view is set true north to vertical or orient your project so that it lines up with that vertical axis or angle and so it will change and if I go to the other true north view without the survey again the whole uh, project has been rotated seemingly but if we look at the original site survey view it still has the original orientation which is what you want you don't want all of your drawings to rotate only the true north views that you're using to set true north and if you need to give your drawings to someone who needs a true, true north orientation they might be useful for that as well so then now I can go back to my even my site analysis view that I've set up and set up or and turn on the sun path and here someone wants to play relative view blah 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 use this option here use the specified project location um, and uh, you can see sun settings changed to intercession so all it's doing is detecting that I hadn't set this view to use the right sun settings and it's giving me a chance to change those so again the top option there you can always check this I'll show you how if you go to your sun settings you can see then it's going to in session still which is using the right location the date there that's okay but I can go to any date that I've set I often we'll just turn that off initially but it can be handy to have it on so there you can see this the sun path but it's too big it's also off to the side now you can select it and we're just waiting for it but it will come back there we go so I've selected it and you can try moving it 
start usually won't let you do anything. So there you can see, even though the move icon works, there we go. I can drag the, I'm actually dragging it there, which is changing the time. And I don't want to do that. So it's going to be careful. So using it as a graphical symbol can be difficult because it is difficult to uh, change the look of it in your view. Um, another option is to change the scale. So when you select it again, over here you'll see in the properties you've got an option for the sun path size, and I can set that to smaller. It's start 150% is the default. So I'm changing it to 100, and that will make it smaller. So at least it fits into the view, but still it is a very difficult thing to work with. And um, also it's been cut off a little bit. So I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to change the view to wireframe. It's gone and disappeared. Oh no, sorry, it's got to be in hidden line, that's right, to see it. So you can't set it to wireframe, you have to set it to hidden line. So the topo surface is going to cover it. So really the only option I've got there to see the full uh, icon or the full um, sun path is to hide these, op these objects temporarily. So I'm just going to right click and hide in view elements or actually, sorry, a better option would be to use the temporary hide. You know about this one, the glasses down the bottom. Is the other, you know about that way of hiding? So that's a really useful option because it doesn't hide things permanently and it's easier to bring them back if you've hidden other things. So I can see my sun path much more clearly now. And then I could also turn cropping off. I'm going to leave the crop region. That's the rectangle. Right, it's good to be able to see that even when it's turned off because I know then I don't need to, well, I need to fit everything I'm doing inside that, that rectangle. But the button next to it, of course, disables cropping altogether, and now I can see the full um, icon. Or some part. So, okay, so the main issue there, you can see, is that it shows you the path only for the time and date you've set. So, you can see quite clearly then, it's 21st of December, now, sometimes people use the 22nd because it does change over time. But I think, I don't know, what, what have you been shown to use? 22nd or 21st? 21st? Okay, so stick with the 21st. Doesn't really, you won't notice the difference. Um, and then you can see here, that's sunrise. It even tells you the time. So that's one thing you want to mark with the sun path diagram. And then you've got sunset as well. Okay, so then to mark those things, I can draw detail lines. So that was another thing I wanted to show you. People don't use these anywhere near enough in Revit. Right, so if you're using model lines, I'll just click on that to show you. Hopefully you know that you've got all these different options for the line styles. And you can draw pretty much any line you like. But if you draw a model line, it's going to show in all of your views. It's a 3D object. I don't want these sun path diagrams to show in any other views. I only want it in this one. So model lines, inappropriate. Detail lines only show in the view you draw them in. So they're like an overlay on top of the drawing. And that's really useful for architectural drawings. You do this sort of thing all the time. In the old days with chasing paper, you would go over a lot of the drawings and just add things that were for one particular slide or drawing. So again, with detail lines, you have the same options for your line styles. So that's a pretty good starting selection, but it is only that. It's only a starting selection. You'll often need to make lines that aren't available in that list. So I thought it's a good chance to have a look at the way you set lines. And this applies to everything. It's not just lines, or detail lines or model lines. Most things in Revit use the same settings. And so it's under the Manage tab. You'll see if you go to Additional Settings first. And just watch out here. If you've got more buttons coming up on your ribbon, if you've got a higher resolution and, and more things are fitting, some of these things that are on the menu here will actually come in as a button next to that instead. But they're still going to be called the same thing. So normally you start with the line weights, okay, because you need the line weights to move on to the line styles. So, as I was saying before, I think the starting line weights in Revit are just horrible, there's no other word for it, 
they're way too heavy like ridiculously heavy so look at the ones at the bottom there it's not as bad as I said it's not 12 mil but 9 mil whoever that's that's almost a centimeter who draws lines that thick no one is the answer you never draw lines that thick so I, I just don't understand why they even put that in as an option it's just way thicker than you'll ever need and you can use those pens for something else so it took me a lot of time to set it up but I do have set up in my own templates um, line weights that are almost exactly half the essential setup but don't just go straight ahead and do that because when you change the line weights for these pens then you've got to go and change the objects that are using a certain pen so good just to stop and think about what you're actually doing in here and uh, I think it's apart from the fact that the settings that they give you to begin with are not good the way it's set up is brilliant and it's one doesn't hear me but it's it's even better than Archicad. Archicad's got a pretty good setup um, but it is a million times better than AutoCAD and and that's the real um, benefit here because in AutoCAD you have to do it manually just like when you're drawing so you've got to decide on the line weight for each line you draw essentially you set it in your layers but you, you, you still are essentially setting line weights to each layer based well, using your own judgment and so then if you have say let's say a 1 to 500 site drawing and then also some 1 to 10 details in the same AutoCAD file you'll need two lots of layers for those because you probably know already when you work with different scales you use different line weights so do you know the general, the general principle when do you use heavier line weights of what scales and when do you use lighter line weights Yeah, lighter scale, so what's a lighter scale? Oh, a larger scale, that's right, yeah, exactly, larger scale, that's right. So, that's right, exactly. So, the larger the scale, which is funny, when people say large scale, what do you think they mean? Big, so you're showing a lot, right? But see, large, large scale, for some people would mean zoomed in, so the object is bigger on the drawing, but when you're talking about, especially architectural drawings at scale, when someone says large scale, what they actually mean is small scale. And I say it as well. So if I say large scale for architectural drawings, I normally mean, I say, a site plan or something that's 1 to 200 or 1 to 500 or even 1 to 1,000. And small scale would be a detail, say, at 1 to 5 or 1 to 10. But, yeah, technically it's the other way around, which is one of those funny things. So, but again, it's the right idea. So site plans and things that are at those scales, say, starting from 1 to 200, you're going to have more lines and they're going to tend to be closer together. So if you have heavy line weights, those lines are going to blur in together and often lead as though they're one line. Details are the opposite. Details, the lines will tend to be further apart and you're going to have fewer lines. Even though it's more detailed, you should be showing more um, elements than you do in the other drawings. The lines, uh, just when you're looking at them in a more abstract way, are definitely overall much further apart than say in a site drawing so you can have heavier lines or the drawing just looks too washed out and then with the ones I think are hardest for most people are the ones you actually do the most things like 1 to 100 and 1 to 50 because you want fairly heavy lines especially when things are being cut you want them to clearly show as heavy lines but you'll also end up with components that are pretty close together and so if your lines are too heavy they do again blur in together and this is where people use judgment and you'll find that there is no rule. People, when they're studying courses like this, uh, often ask, what's the standard for line weights? What is the line weight I should be using? What's, just tell me the numbers. And the answer is there is no standard because you should be working those out based on the scale and it will change a lot. And also you can get a lot of um, your own style for your drawings by coming up with your own way of doing line weights. So some people prefer heavy line weights and they like that you know bold look to their drawings. Other people prefer lighter line weights showing more detail. I like a range, so I, I try to get a really big range of line weights from heavy to light. So again, there's no rule for line weights, but there is a standard or a convention you should follow. And the only convention is light, medium, heavy. 
So some things should always be light, some things should always be medium, some things should be heavy. Things that are being cut should always be the heaviest. Uh, things that are below the cut plane, say a hatch for your floor tiles, should always be the lightest. And then you've got everything in between. So things that are above the floor plane might be medium. And what I do, which is something not everyone does, but I tend to do the hatching of things like walls with a medium line weight so that it reads as being a bit heavier than the, the things for the, say, floor tiles below. And so you get a bit more depth to the drawings that way. So we've got the line weight so showing, I'm going to use the defaults, but you need to know what these are as well. So pen one is a, should be always the lightest. And then two, you can see is where you start getting into medium, 0.25. Three, that's really my heavy. And that's only the third one, and then they go heavier. So that's what I'll use for now. Just one, two, and three, though. That should be enough. So I'll cancel this. And then the next one is uh, line styles. So I'm going to go there. And you've got to click on the plus next to lines to see all the pens. So I might make a pen that isn't here, so we don't have, oh, we've got that one, we've got a two, we've got a three, yeah, it looks like, I do have the ones I want, I'll do one a different colour, just as an example, so I don't have any, say, red, so I might want a red pen, so I'm just going to make a new subcategory, which is a new, new line type, basically, and we'll call this red uh, let's just make it red light. Right, so then you can set a colour. And for the line weight, you choose one of those pens. So red light could be either pen one or two. They're both fairly light. Um, I I'm going to do two. I think, no, I'll do one if you'll. I'll, I'll I'll do another one called red medium maybe. So I'll do another one there and let's call it red medium. And then change that again to red. And this one I'll make pen two. Now what I think is interesting here is that they've got these pens with a weight in the name. So they've got dash 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.25. Do you think those line weights are right? No. no. Exactly. That's it. So it's just a guide. It's again that thing, light, medium and heavy. That's what they're really saying there. But they shouldn't have put the numbers in, it just confuses everyone. And the same with these. So one mil. So it's again not one mil, because we know they don't have a oh, one centimetre. But, uh, yeah, 1.4. What does that even mean? Uh, so, anyhow. Um, well, maybe it is one, one mil, but I think it's heavier than that in the pen settings. Okay, so I've got my... Uh, my new line type, so which is the main thing, or line styles. But before I finish up there, I thought I'd just show you one last thing on this tab as well, but not under the additional settings. Over here on the left, you've got object styles. So this is where you set the line weights for most other things in Revit. So if you've had trouble getting the light line weights, you've got to adjust them in here. So walls, for example knows how they're set to pen 1, but that's for projection. But if they're being cut, they're pen 4. Which I think is a little bit too heavy, so I'll usually lighten that a little bit. But I'll do that by going and changing the pens. Okay, so, and then you can set the colours. So people think you've got to just use the colours that they give you, but you can, of course, change the colours of your lines in AutoCAD if you come in here. And you can even assign materials here. So you can set a default material for all of your walls, and that sometimes is going to help you. But I'm not going to change anything there. I'm just going to start doing my sum path now. So I'm going to go to, uh, again, annotate, detail lines, and I'll draw an arc. Just tracing from sunset to sunrise, which should be over here. It which should snap to it, even though you don't have to. And I'll just place the curve 
up here. I didn't set my line style, but I can always select it afterwards and then just change it here to one that I've made or another one, and you can see then it's a red line. And so you could mark the other important things. Um, the zenith. Oh, now this is, I think, always interesting. You'll see that um, north is not the same necessarily as midday. So I'm going to go back to summer solstice. There we are. So notice how at midday the sun is slightly off uh, the north axis there, which should be the zenith. So that's what should be expected actually, um, because they have changed the way that time is measured um, over the years. And so it was actually originally, as far as I know, based on true north, but, uh, but again, it should be slightly off. So if you see your sun, uh, or your midday sun at true north, uh, you've got a problem. Um, but it shouldn't be far off. So you can either mark north, some people actually do that, but you're better off marking... Oh no, no, do that, sorry, yeah, don't use... So some people, sorry, what I was saying is, some people mark the midday sun, 12 o'clock, but you should mark the zenith instead, which is north. So again, just with a detail line there, I can mark that. And what did I do? Forget to set the style again. So let's go and do that now. Okay, so now I need to work out sunrise and sunset in the winter solstice. So if you have a look at the options you have for multi-day, you can actually get both of them to come up at the same time. But I might show you that later. It's probably easier at first just to do what you were saying before, which is to set winter solstice, and then you'll see the change. So I've already drawn my detail lines. I know where the summer solstice um, sunrise and sunset are, and now I can draw the winter sunrise and sunset uh, with my red pen. There we are, red medium line, and that should be it. It'll do. Now I can turn my sun path off in this view. And I just have the lines. Um, I might draw a few extra lines in at the end. So we're just trying to get it perpendicular to the um, to the arc, Something like that. And there you go. Uh, you should, by rights, draw the uh, direction that the sun is going to be moving. But maybe I'll do that after I've reduced it. So I'm going to select all of these lines just using control and then use the scale tool and I'll scale it graphically. Have you had a look at using numerical scales? No? Okay, well maybe I'll show you that one. So you've done graphical scale. There's an option up there. That's a good one. But numerical scale can be useful as well. So there, if you change it to numerical, you can just type in a scale factor. So maybe we'll try 0 0.7. And then click a base point afterwards. And it'll scale around that point. So that, that can be useful. So there you can see I've got the sun path. So it'll fit on the sheet, but maybe it's still... Uh, it could be a little too big, so I'm going to go and have a look at my view on the sheet, and yeah, that looks okay. So I'm going to bring back my other objects. Uh, I can do it on the sheet actually, so I'm going to activate the view on the sheet. And then reset my temporary height isolate down the bottom, and my site will come back. You could even go to a shaded view here, it wouldn't matter because the detail lines will stay over the top. Now you should definitely still have a north arrow. Okay, so this isn't enough to show north. 
uh, even though it does have that line which is pointing at north, you should also definitely keep your north arrow. Turn cropping back on. And so, okay, so the shading could be useful, but if you even if you're going to use it, I would recommend that you bring that in as a separate layer into AutoCAD. So, uh, sorry, into, into Photoshop, I mean. So what I was going to show you first is how to get the line work set up in Photoshop. So I'm just going to deactivate the view. And, oh no, sorry, I'll reactivate it so that I can just check as well what's happening there with the, um, with the view I've cropped it. So is it my um, annotation crop? Let's go in off the sheet. Let's just have a look. Oh no, it's not using annotation crop. So what is it? Something off to the side. Maybe it's because of... Oh, it's my um, my text. Yeah. So watch out for that one. It's an easy thing to, um, to miss, but I'll just show you why I noticed it. Because you can see here when I select my viewport, it's much bigger than the page. And if you're wondering uh, how you get viewport size, it's normally based on your crop region. So even if you've got a view that's fitting onto your page easily, you should still crop it because the viewport might be bigger than your page. And it will actually create print errors sometimes if the, if the things you're trying to print don't fit on the sheet. So it's a good idea to get everything that you can see fitting into that page border and everything I can see actually does, but you can see when I go to highlight it again, it's going off the page. So it's not the crop region though, it's the, the text. So I'll show you that's usually annotation, it's not crop region. So I'm going to activate the view. And there's my big text item that's causing all the problems. So I'll just bring that back. So it's on the sheet, and let's have a look at this one. That one's not as bad, but I'll still fix it. So I'll deactivate the view. What do you know? Pretty much fitting on the sheet. It's just this reference plane now that goes off. So I'll also fix that. Okay, so notice that's 2D, that's why it was off the sheet, and again that's still annotated. Just because uh, it's the boundary that I'm using to set my horizontal um, axis. So that's an important axis. Most of the, there should be something in the building that is parallel to that. That's all. So. Oh, no, no. So you could even hide it in this view. So. It shouldn't print anyway, but yeah, it doesn't hurt to hide it. And so that's almost ready to bring into Photoshop. But, uh, well, I'm going to show you a couple of things. So I'll do it the wrong way first, on purpose. And uh, so I'm going to make a... Uh, so I'm going to open a new file. So I'm going to go back to Photoshop and just close anything that I have open, just to free up some resources. I'm just going to close all these files, and then we'll have the welcome screen. In a moment, I'll let it do its thing, and go back to Rabbit. So I'm going to make a PDF file using what I have there, really so I can show you how not to do it. Um, so I'm going to go and print, come on, print, and then choose Adobe PDF. So have you all got that option on your own computers? I've talked to you about getting the virtual printer. Yep, so you need that. Or if you haven't got Adobe PDF, do you know about the other free ones? Qt and uh, Nitro is okay as well. Nitro is actually one of the best ones, yeah. Um, Primo PDF. I think actually Primo is the free version of Nitro. So they're all okay. And, and some of them can actually do more than the Adobe one. So you should always be able to make a PDF um, using this option, even if you don't have the Adobe Suite. Always, of course, check your page setup because we need this to scale. So it is memory an A3 page, and so that should give me the right page setup. There we are. So I'm going to click OK, make my PDF file. Set up by one, also. Okay. 
So I just want to show you what will happen if I open this up in Photoshop. You probably guess that we're going to get the shading. And the reason that's going to be a problem is that it can only bring the shading in if it's a raster file. It can't bring the shading in uh, if it's a vector file. So, and normally you want vectors. That's what we're trying to achieve here. And it's a big problem. A lot of people, uh, especially if you're not coming from an AutoCAD or a hand drawing background, um, don't appreciate these things because you're so used to working in Revit with this graphical um, view style and you only realise much later that that is not what you want when you go into another program. Okay, so it should be done now, there it is. Okay, so it's made my PDF file finally. I don't need to keep it open, so I can close that and then open it in Photoshop. And this is where it'll tell you, <laughs> even though it's already rasterized, it'll tell you that it's going to rasterize it. So I'm just going to open PDF file. So it's good to realize, if you don't already, that Photoshop can open any PDF file. But lots of PDF files are going to have multiple pages, so you have to choose which page it's going to bring in can only do one page at a time. So if you've got a 40 page PDF and you want to work on all 40 pages, you've got to open the file 40 times and choose each different page. Here, not a problem because we've only got one page. And in a second, it'll come up with the options for the rasterizing, in other words, converting this into pixels but we know it is actually converted into pixels already, we just need to give a resolution, which you'll see come up here. There it is. Okay, so this is the option to invert PDF, but import PDF, which again is mainly to do with the rasterizing. Over here you can see it's got a resolution. So it's 300 dpi, which is pretty good. Like I said, that's basically the standard these days. Sometimes you'll lose detail though when you bring in a, um, say, a Revit drawing. You won't, you'll see, you'll be able to zoom in and you'll see that, it, that it's um, pixelated, some of the details that you might have wanted, and in those situations you just need to increase the resolution here. <coughs> I've never needed to go over 600, um, so that's about as high as you should have to go. Okay, so it'll take it a second. Oh no, not too bad. So I'm going to zoom in here, let me just prove to you, it is all pixels. So comparing that to what we have in Revit, that end is never going to be pixelated. No matter how far we zoom in, it's always going to be crisp lines because it's vectors. Okay, so it's storing a start point and an end point for the edge there. And no matter what the resolution, that's always going to be a perfectly smooth line. Photoshop doesn't work that way. And notice also that it is all um, on one layer, so all the shading and the lines are in together in the one layer, which means if I want to say change the colour there of this shading, I'd need to select those pixels and, and redo them. If I instead change that to hidden line, right, so I'm just going to right click and uh, I'll just activate the view and I'll just change this to hidden line, then activate it. Go to print again, and you can leave all the settings. Just going to click OK, and I'm just going to give this a different name, so I'll call this Site Analysis Setup 2, that'll do. Now, notice how much faster it is as well. Great thing about vectors, they're much better quality than, than raster images, but they're also faster and smaller to store, so again just to prove it to you, zooming in here, doesn't matter how far I zoom in, it's always going to give me perfect lines because again it is vectors. Now the advantage when we bring that into Photoshop isn't just the quality, the quality will be better, but that's not the main advantage, the main advantage is that it will work around or cut around those vectors for you. So if I open this, get the same options, I'm not going to change the resolution there, I'll leave it on 300. There we are, cut out line work. 
Now, a lot of people get worried when they see this because you can't see everything clearly, mainly because of that checkerboard pattern. That checkerboard pattern just means we're looking at a transparency. So the checkerboard is your very back layer, and so it's behind the lines. But if you zoom in, you'll see the lines are all there. There's nothing missing from what we had in Revit. Okay, so then you can see it's all there. But what I often do to make it easier to look at is over in the layers. Um, firstly, I'll, I'll duplicate the layers. So I think a good trick in the local people don't use in Photoshop is to keep the original layer. In case something goes wrong, you can always get back to it. So I'll give it a better name. I'll call this line work. Yeah, that's right. You just double click on the name. Yep, that's right. And then to duplicate the layer, all you do is drag that thumbnail down onto the new button. That easy. So we'll call this one. We'll call this one line work, and we'll call this one line work uh, backup. And then this one we'll call just line work. Now I can make a layer in between. I'll make a new layer, and we'll call this shading. Shading one. We're going to have a few of them. Okay, so now I can draw in a, um, or just select an area and just do a bit of shading just to get started with that if you haven't done much shading in Photoshop. So I'm going to use here the polygonal lasso, this button over here. If you click and hold down that button, you'll see there's a few other options. If it's not on polygonal, you can easily change it there. And so I can click points and... I zoomed right in stupidly, probably didn't need to go that far, but uh, still it won't take too long. So I'm just clicking points, notice under the boundary. I don't need to go exactly up to that edge, because this is going to sit under the layer. Okay, it's just taking a little while to get over to the other side, and you can't zoom unfortunately while you're doing this. So I do, I'll try one of the shortcuts actually. Yeah, sorry, some, you can zoom, sorry. Control minus is a shortcut for zooming in Photoshop. So that works, the wheel won't, but control minus will. So that's a good one to know. So here we are, I'm just gonna click the other points and there I can double click on the last point to get connect it back to the beginning. Okay, so I've got that area selected. And now I can just go and uh, well, I'll just do a quick fill and get some sort of uh, colour in there. Well, oh no, so we don't have any good colour. So I'll uh, just choose a um, new foreground colour. Let's go for a greenish sort of colour. That might do. And you can either use the paint bucket, but the paint bucket. Yeah, we'll just use the paint bucket for now, actually. So there we are. So I filled that area in with the paint bucket. Um, and I'm uh, just going to show you something. The paint bucket can be an interesting one because it, um, yeah, it works a bit like the magic wand tool sometimes. So you've got to be careful with that. But here it's done what I wanted it to and shaded all the way up to the edge of my selection. So I've got that basic fill. And the line work goes over the top of it, as you saw there. And um, so you'll find often that you'll need to come back and adjust these things and make the shading a bit more subtle. That's really easy now because I can just adjust, say, the transparency of that layer. And uh, oh no, sorry, I skipped a step I meant to show you as well that to make it easier to look at, I can essentially do the same thing but with the whole layer, or sorry, the whole sheet. So I'll make yet another layer starting with the bottom layer selected. I'm going to actually turn that one off now because that's our backup. We don't need to see that anymore. I'm going to click on the new layer button to make a brand new layer and we'll call this uh, white background. Call it white page or something like that. And then I'm just going to go to edit, fill and change this to white. Ah, now watch out there. It didn't fill in my whole sheet. Why do you think it didn't? 
Exactly, I've got a selection, that's good. So Control D, deselects, and then I'll just go and do the same thing. Edit Fill, leave it on white, and it'll fill in the whole page. So having that white background just makes it easier to see everything you're doing. And now, if I go and adjust the transparency or the opacity of my shading, you can see straight away what that's doing. Now, that's something you could do in Revit, but making those quick adjustments to the colours is still more work in Revit. And then when you, ha again, go and have a look at those other options, things like gradients. Uh, oh, why is it doing that? Sorry, that's me being stupid again. Uh, select pixels, there we are. Oh, sorry, now I just did that one quickly. This is a really good tool, actually, so I'll just point that one out. When you right-click on a layer, see a lot of people spend ages trying to select everything on the layer, but if you just right-click, you can always just go to Select Pixels, and that'll select every active pixel on that layer. So that's a really good way of selecting everything on a certain layer. If you want to get the line work, that works really well too. So, uh, again, so now I can use the gradient tool. Where'd it go? This one? No, that's not it. Sorry under one of these, so I always forget this one. So then here, click and drag, and I can do a basic gradient using my current colours. Really easy in Photoshop, but that is next to impossible with Revit. And then, what was the other thing I was going to show you? Oh yeah, patterns. So you may have a texture for a site analysis plan, don't go overboard with these things. But um, you may also want to have photos overlaid on, uh, on your site analysis as well. That could be a good option. So there'll be various reasons you want to bring patterns or um, even images into your um, Photoshop file you're doing for your site analysis. So I'm going to just get something. Maybe I'll do that tile texture again just to show you something a little bit different. So I've got that very basic tile in a separate file. So I just did Control A, Control C, select all under the select menu and then edit copy and do the same thing. Copy that on the clipboard. Now I'm going to go into my other file and just draw a selection using the um, polygonal lasso, lasso tool. And so we might have a pathway maybe here. I know you don't, but just as a simple example. If you want to do, oops, if you want to do curves, you can, but the pen tool might be easier. So here, this is just with straight edges for now, but you can definitely do curves. Uh, for your shapes in Photoshop, it's uh, a really good option. But that's, that's what I'm going to use as my selection. So now I'm going to make a new layer and then paste and it should by default paste, no it's not pasting into by default, that's weird so I'll choose it from the menu, so under edit paste special and then paste into there we go, that forces it into the selection and then I can control T to, and I should say on the menu it would be um, free transform it's the same as control T and you can scale of course and move and get the size you want and then double click to finish and hold down alt if you want to copy oh sorry but you've got to be on uh, the move tool so there we are alt and then you can copy and it should stay within that selection marquee which is really handy it should snap as well don't know why it isn't but I oh know let's try again so I'll do alt again but I'll use shift, that's a simple um, option that you can get used to move things uh, orthogonally. This one I've got to do a couple. Yeah. Okay, so it doesn't take too long to do shading with textures. If you set up patterns, you can make that even more automated so the textures will repeat automatically. If you've had a look at setting up patterns in Photoshop, it's not, it's not that hard. But if you really like this sort of work, and a lot of people do, I know a few people who are presentation specialists, so one who works in one of the biggest firms in Australia, um, and all he does is presentation drawings, but with Illustrator.
more than Photoshop. And so if you like that style of work, it's a good thing to specialise in. Um, and patterns in Illustrator um, give you even more options and I think they're even easier than Photoshop to set up because of the type of program Illustrator is the fact that it lets you work with both vectors and pixels. So have a look at it. Has anyone tried to make a hatch pattern in AutoCAD? It's pretty painful. I don't like doing it and I like technical stuff. So it's hard, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. It's not an easy thing, but a lot of people still need to do it because you often need custom ha hatch patterns. But if again you find yourself in that situation, have a look at Illustrator because you can bring or use the same pattern files. It uses PAT files, which is what AutoCAD uses as well. But to make your own patterns in Illustrator, there's actually a utility that lets you draw the pattern and set up how it's going to repeat. And it's a beautiful little tool. It's easy for anyone who knows AutoCAD will be able to use it. And you can make your own hatch patterns. They work just like hatch patterns in AutoCAD, but you get a ton of extra options like nice colours and shading and all those things. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, but look, it's something. Look, the more you know Revit, the easier it'll be to learn AutoCAD, and you'll you'll reach a point with Revit where you just can't go any further without go, going back and, and learning AutoCAD. So everyone does in the end, but I know when you're doing the courses, you, you know, just often don't have the time. So uh, so there was one other thing. Oh yeah, uh, okay. The other thing I wanted to show you. So that's working with Photoshop with just the lines from Revit. But you might be thinking, well, I'm going to do all this work in Revit to get maybe. Apart from the shading, I might want the shadows. That's a really nice thing to get from Revit. So what I'll do is, well again, I'm going to activate the view and turn the shadows on, of course. And so I've only got that one shadow. Later I'll, of course, have a lot more. But I'll just bring that one in now. And so the way I tend to do it is I'll bring that in as a separate layer. And so even if I have the shading in Revit, I'll, I won't bring the shadows in with the shading. Right, and you'll see why in a second. So I'm going to just print again to PDF. And here's the message. Sometimes it tells you. Right, raster will be used for printing. Now it's because I've turned the shadows on. It's a hidden line view. So the line work wouldn't have been a problem. It could have kept it as vectors. But because it's got the shadows there, it needs to rasterize it. It's just like shading if you have shadows, even in hidden line. That's okay, I know that, so I'm happy about the rasterizing. I'm not happy about it, but you know, it's, I know I've got to live with it. So then, I made another PDF file. And I can just keep layering it up. And that's the key with Photoshop. Building up a big stack of layers that give you that incremental control over your images. So I'll close this, I don't need a file in Acrobat, but back into Photoshop now, I can go and open my new PDF file, number three, yep, just leave the defaults, Control A, Control C, back to here, the one with all my layers, and make sure it's going in at the right level. So I want my shadows to go over this shading. Right, so I've got all of the layers there with the, um, the different things that I've done. Uh, so what are these ones for again? Probably forgotten now. Oh yeah, so they're all my, um, all my patterns. So I've got a lot of layers because of the way I've done it. I'm going to merge them down first. I'm going to hold down shift and select that group of layers and then go to the layer menu and merge layers because they could easily be one layer and then again I'm going to paste under the edit menu I'll just choose paste or control V and that should now make a new layer okay so it's got this layer layer 2 so it's everything else over the top of the result. yeah yeah okay so it's covering everything and I don't want that. Now, it's not covering the lines. The line work is still separate. So that's nice and high quality, or as you know, high as it needs to be. Um, so you might think, I've got to cut all the white out and just leave the shadows. That's what a lot of people do. There's an easier way. In your layers, 
try some of these different, um, what are they called again? Blending modes, I think is the proper term, blends. But they're really just modes for your layers. So if you go to this one, multiply, what it's doing is taking the dark values and making them dark, so they increase the color value. Light values become transparent. So all of the white is now see-through, and I'm just left with the area that's showing the shadows going nicely over the top of my shading. And then going even further, I can easily fade the shadows and get a much more graphical drawing in Photoshop instead of trying to fiddle around for hours in Revit with all the different graphics options that you have there that still might not give you what you want. So, and then if you understand, if you get that to work, later when you do your rendering, you can use the same technique to do your ambient shadows and lots of things. This is how professional visualization people um, do the, uh, a lot of the, the really realistic, or well, the renderings that look realistic that you might think are you know, almost like a photo and that they have these, you probably think they have these amazing rendering programs that do all of that for them. But what, what you really find is that they do have good software like that, but then also they make them look better by, by using that technique or very similar techniques for things like the shadows. And, and you can take it even further than that. So I know there's a firm in either Austria or one of the places that used to be part of Austria. It might be um, Czech Republic or something, I can't remember that. Um, anyhow, one of those countries, um, I remember I watched the, um, I went to a lecture with uh, one of the guys from, uh, well he works at V-Ray now, but he worked at one of the big visualisation firms there for years, and uh, I can't believe I've got no great firm. Anyhow, he showed us how they do their layers in Photoshop, and they basically would have a layer for every material in their render, and export. So when they do their realistic render, they'll get a layer for each one. Um, it was a separate file and then they'd merge those all into one. And you might think that's crazy, but it was brilliant because it meant that if they had to change a particular material, they didn't have to render the whole thing again. They could easily just go and make the layer adjustments and they were fine tuning almost every layer to get the realistic look. They knew how to make it look real, but they didn't just let the software, you know, there's no button they could press and say make it real. They used their eyes and their knowledge to, to do that. So again, a lot of it done with Photoshop. And uh, it, it sounds complicated when you probably see it the first time, it looks, maybe looks complicated, but give it a go. Once you've got that technique worked out, then you can just keep updating that file. So very last thing, if I make a change, so we know we've got to put more buildings in, maybe I'll just go and, uh, and add one in quickly. Okay, so I'm just going to select my uh, in-place model that I've made for that building already. and do it on my satellite one, actually. Mm. Okay, so we've got uh, the nice uh, Victorian building over here, which I will just do as a boring box to begin with. That'll do. Hope it's on my sheet. And yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So I'll just check the, uh, the height. It's probably higher than that. So then that should be enough. Just as long as it's on my sheet. Yep. All good. Okay, so I've made that change. So I'd start by updating the line work. So I'll just turn the shadows off. And uh, make a new PDF. Shouldn't need to change any settings. So this will be I'd probably give them better names than this, but I know number two is my uh, drawing with the line work, so I'll make this 2A. Okay, so then I can go back into Photoshop, open my new file. Yeah, okay, again, Control A, Control C, go into the file I've set up, so I'll close some of these others.
better save it as well. I haven't saved it, so uh, it's really important that when you're working with a file like this that has layers, that you save it as a Photoshop file. It will let you save it as a PDF, a Photoshop PDF. Don't do that. Um, so make sure you're saving it as a PSD file, which is the Photoshop format. Okay, just because it might crash here, and that would be very sad. Uh, so, the other files that I've got open, I'm just going to keep closing those. And here's the one that I just opened a moment ago. So, so I've got my Limework layer on the top there. I'm going to paste my new layer in, and I can delete the previous Limework layer just by dragging that onto the trash can at the bottom. And now you can see layer 3, which is my new line work layer that I'll rename. It's brought the lines in from my building here. And then, and I'll show you something we can do there in a moment as well, um, after I bring in the other updated layer. So now I've got to get the shadows. So I'll activate this and get the shadows on, deactivate, and then go and make a new file. So I can adjust them separately. So oh remember I... Of course, so otherwise, yeah. with, when you're making your shadow lighter, it'll actually make all the line look lighter. Exactly, okay. yeah, that's it, exactly. Yeah. That's it, that's really the key to it. It's, it's the, you know, giving you, or making it easy for you to make adjustments, that's really what this is all about. So, okay, so now again, open the new file. Okay, there's the one, obviously the new shadow. And now, another way of doing it, instead of pasting into a new layer, you can paste into, um, into the layer that it's on. So, paste in place. Oh no, that's, that's not doing it. Why isn't it? So, I'm used to a new version of Photoshop, which is... Ah. So, look, it's coming on a new layer. I wanted to show you that you can definitely get it to go into the... Oh, yeah, sorry, it's on, on the selection, so let's show now. No. Should let me paste into, but for some reason it's not. Maybe I've got to select... Oh, yeah, here we go, paste into. No, it's doing something strange, doing a mask. Okay, forget that. We'll just make a new layer and remember the setting. So, it's just that opacity, 47%. And so, I'll just paste normally. If I paste them. Uh, you could, yeah, you could actually, that's not a bad option. Yeah, you could merge down and see if it keeps the setting from the layer below. It might not do that though, so it wouldn't be hard just to change this to 47 and then delete the other layer. So, really, the key to it though is keeping everything in the same position. Notice how everything is lining up automatically because I've got it set up on the page in Revit and then I don't need to adjust anything or I don't need to change the position of anything when I bring it in to Photoshop. And, uh, and so that way you can easily make changes in Revit no matter what stage you're at with your site analysis. Even if it's finished, you can make changes and then update that with the new changes. Um, oh yeah, so like I said, there was one last thing I wanted to show you. That Limework layer. I haven't done much with, I've just put it over the top. But sometimes you might want to adjust it. And you might want to make it darker, for example. So it's on the top here. We can't make the opacity anymore because it's already 100%. You can try some of these like darken, but they won't do anything because again it's vectors. So it's not going to do a lot there. Uh, so there are a couple of tricks though. If you go to channels, you can try this option here. And so, oh yeah, so you've got to turn the other layers off. So I'll just go back and uh, turn off all the other layers just temporarily and then try that one again. There we are. So that option there, it's basically doing an alpha selection. So it's basically, it's selecting anything that has a color value. And so you can see there we've got some of the lines a little bit faint on the edge. So you can fill that 
just to beef them up a, a bit. That's one way of doing it. Ah, notice what it's done. It's filled everything but. So I'll undo that, Control Z. And, well, anyone know what I need to do? Exactly, select inverse and then fill. That works. And then you can also, so it just beefs them up a little bit. And then you can also try growing the selection to make it a little bit bigger. And you can do that a couple of times and it'll just fatten the lines a little bit where it can. Um, there are ways of offsetting the lines as well, but that's harder. You think you've got to use the feathering options. But um, anyhow, that's probably enough. And so again, I can fill that with black and you can see that's made the lines quite a bit heavier. So that's something to think about as well. And uh, again, fairly easy because I've got everything separated in my layers. Alrighty, so uh, I might show you the the pen tool next time because that's you know almost a world in itself. And lost under one of these buttons, so I do have a slightly different setup normally to this. Which one is it? Anyone know where the pen tool lives? It's one of these. Why can't I see it? Oh, there it is. They've moved down here. Okay, how did they look down there? Yeah, okay, that's a pen tool. So that's what you use to draw shapes. So just if you're going to try this during the week, I know a lot of people try to use the pencil tool, which is this one here, which can do similar things, but it's, it's difficult to use if you want any control over your lines. So again, if you're interested in drawing shapes, uh, particularly uh, things where you've got curves or you need some sort of control or even just straight lines actually it's still a good tool. Um, the pen tool is the best one. But again it's a big thing um, and uh, I need time to go through that so I'll show you that next week. And uh, that should give you plenty of time to make some more progress on your site analysis. Uh, don't, go, don't get carried away but it's a nice uh, opportunity for you to do a more presentation style drawing than maybe what you're used to and, and experiment with some different graphics. Um, I know I've said this is the last thing a few times, but I maybe will just show you some of my... Are you sure? Sorry? Oh, you want to go for a break? Yes, yeah, so I'll just be literally for a, a minute and, and show you some examples of some graphical drawings to finish up. And uh, so we've got a lot of the... Um, drawings that my interior students do, which are done using the techniques I've just been showing you. Here we go. Again, I just want you to see some because I know you, you wouldn't have been exposed to many presentation style drawings before. And this is still maybe a little bit technical looking, but much more presentation style than, than what you're used to. So this was done that way. Line drawing from Revit and then most of the shading done with uh, Photoshop. Here's another one. This drawing that's still coming up at the top. Got this student probably the, the best mark in the year when she graduated. This is from several years ago. Mainly because of that hatch. I think that's that's really what sold the assessors. The design was good. I mean, it was a, it was actually a really good proposal, but uh, they just got carried away with that uh, ground hatch because a lot of people will do things like gradients, which are okay, but that's a really nice thing you can do fairly easily in Photoshop and make it look almost like a watercolor drawing. Now. It's still loading, so maybe I won't wait for it, but it's a section in case you're wondering, so there's a big cross section up there, which, oh yep, there we are. Okay, so, uh, you know, just something to think about, and like I said, it's a good chance when you're doing a site analysis drawing to try out different presentation styles instead of the more technical drawings that you're probably used to. And this girl is an absolute whiz on Revit now. She was pretty good when she was a student, but um, she is... Uh, one of the most knowledgeable 
that I know of who's out there in the industry who's working for a fairly well-known firm. So I'll finish up there anyway, unless you've got any other questions about that. Now, don't tell me it wasn't recording. Oh, yeah, it was recording. <laughs> yeah. That would be very sad. <laughs>